Barry, I'm from IID, I'm from Susan Nandudu. Do you want to give yourself a quick introduction? Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Susan Nandudu and I work with the African Center for Trade and Development here in Kampala, Uganda. Happy to have you all. Great, Barry? thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you skip on the slides, please? So this is the running order for today. Um, we are, give me two seconds. So we are, first of all, we're going to give a quick introduction and we'll run through some housekeeping, although I'm sure everybody's painfully aware because we've all been doing these Zoom meetings for quite some time. We're then going to do a quick Mentimeter poll. Uh, we have a key question we'd like to pose you and we'd like you to answer that so we can hopefully get some interesting insights. Um, thereafter, we're going to move to presentations. We've got three presentations today. Uh, the first is from Johnny. Uh, he's from the Forest and Farm Facility, and he's going to be talking uh, about the associative commercialization mechanism. Thereafter, we'll have a five-minute Q&A, so there will be a chance to interact and ask some questions on the presentation. After that, we have Moses. He is no, from. Can you please mute your mics? Thanks. Uh, thereafter, we have Moses from Adele Sofala. Uh, he's going to be presenting on the accumulating sa uh, savings and credit methodology. And then we'll have a quick QA after that. Thereafter, we have another presentation of 10 minutes from Rebecca, who works with Acumen. And she is going to be presenting on the Acumen Resilient Agricultural Fund. And then there will be a Q&A after that. After that, we will move into group work, um, which whereby you'll be put into small groups and asked to work through a couple of questions. And then we'll come back into plenary and then uh, report back on the, uh, the more interesting findings. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Susan. Susan is going to zoom through all the... Uh, the, the housekeeping, and yes, that pod was intended. Uh, so I'll just hand you over to Susan now. Okay, thank you. So if you were flying to CBA 14, uh, the cabin crew would give you some safety tips. Today we are going to talk about housekeeping uh, in a Zoom meeting. Um, so you may have had them, but um, would like you to be aware of these. Please note that IIED are recording the meeting and may take, we make part of it available on our website. We have taken security precautions to discourage uninvited participants from joining the meeting. Um, and take away inappropriate comments or other comment. If you notice any such content, please notify the host via the chat function and they will remove any offending participants from the meeting. This is pretty important. Please do not share the link to join this meeting on social media or any uninvited participants via social media because they are a number on source of they are the number one source of Zoom bombing activity. For the best meeting experience, please close all non-essential applications on your device, particularly messaging apps such as Skype. Next, please. So initially your microphone will be muted by the host, but during the breakout sessions later in the meeting, you'll be able to unmute your mic by clicking on that icon. Next, you can share your webcam video if you choose. And if you, experience, if you experience connection problems, you should turn your video off so that you can be able to hear um, and have a better experience. Now the participants icon will open the panel on the right of the screen where you, you can interact with the host using the icons at the bottom. Chat, the chat room will be open. So it will open a panel where you can enter your comments and questions or request technical support. We will respond to as many as time allows, but we'd like to really encourage that you use the chat room function to share your comments and your questions such that at, at the opportune time we can read them out to the right or responsible people to give you a response. 
So the share screen option is disabled for participants in the meeting, but please note that the record function for participants is equally disabled. Next, please. Reactions enables you to share immediate feedback with the presenter. Remember, we are not meeting in person, so should you feel excited about the discussion, do like or dis share using those icons on your screen. Next. So finally, we'd like to remind you that IIED is recording the meeting and may make parts of it available on the website at a later date. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please inbox me via the chat box and we'll be sure to assist you. Thank you. Over to you, Barry. Thank you. Um, so just having a, an eye on the chat box, it seems to be everybody saying hello, uh, which is great. Please keep that up. We very much want to have an interactive session. As Susan mentioned, we can't meet in person, which is a bit of a shame. However, if we can try and make this as interactive as possible, and when we, we're going to move into breakout groups later on, and when we do, we'd certainly encourage everyone to put their camera on if you can, uh, and then we can have uh, a little bit more of an interaction. But we're going to move on to the presentations in a moment, but before we get into them, I first want to sort of set the scene for the session. I want to kick things off with the definition of what we're actually meaning by delivery mechanism. So, when we talk about delivery mechanisms, we're talking about transparent and accountable governance, management and financial arrangements that are going to facilitate local adaptation, either by helping the local actors prioritise adaptation actions or by channeling flexible finance into the hands of local actors so they can, uh, they can make their own adaptation investments. So their, their mechanisms are going to be based upon the subsidiarity principle. And this is where local development and adaptation decisions are actually going to be made at the lowest effective level, unless it's going to be more effective to do it at, at a higher scale. And this allows those with the most knowledge and experience to actually lead the decision making. And the delivery mechanisms, they should strengthen local actors' capabilities to consider climate risks over different timescales. They should also help shift incentives so that local actors can make choices that are going to perform better over longer time horizons and cost effectively aggregate local adaptation at scale. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to, if you could skip on, um, we're now going to do a Mentimeter poll. So this is the question that we'd like you to answer. So uh, Egley, do you want to explain how this is, is going to run? I believe you just go to menti.com. Oh, no, nope, yep, there. If you just go to menti.com, uh, and then if you use that code and then if you could just give quite a succinct answer to this question, uh, that would be great. And then we'll, we'll, put, the, uh, we'll put the answers up on, up on screen. Egli, is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. You just use the website and put in the code when it pops in on your screen and you'll see the question and you'll be able to submit your answer. So if you could just open that in another browser window or on your device and then we can, uh, then we can have a look and we can see the results. Egli, can you put the uh, the code back up just so people can have One it? One second. I just want to go to the website, so. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, it's already in the chat room, so you can use the code in the chat room. Bro, thank you.
Hi, Barry. Can you see the answers? Yes, I can. I was just typing my my own one. Good. We're getting some good we're getting some good interaction here. Let's have a look. Can you can you Emily, can you scroll uh, scroll through, please? Prioritizing at design stage, yep, good, great. Focus on achieving overall and I'd like focus on achieving overall outcomes and unite around these. Is that different agencies? Is that different bodies? I'm quite keen to sort of unpack some of these. By establishing a transparent platform that make possible for everyone to access to the information related to the financial support. That's great, yeah. Transparency and accountability, that's a big one. Absolutely. Partnership with local organizations, is that local governments, is that CBOs? How, how would this, how would this, um, how would this partnership come about? I'd be keen to think about that. Who, who's, who, who, would, who would sort of initiate and sort of ensure that takes place? Empowering grassroots and supporting answers, absolutely. Encouraging PPPs across sectors, avoid working in silos to create synergies. Yep, yep, absolutely. By aligning lawlessies, I think that's policies, program institutions and practices. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think, I think, I think the question is how do we achieve this alignment? It's, uh, it's, it's no, no easy feat. Um, someone's asking uh, for the Mentimeter code again. Uh, somebody could drop it in the chat, that'd be great. It's just on the top on the website. Ah, super, thank you. Uh, listen to local people, mm -hmm. local and indigenous knowledge, great. Can we, sorry, Agley, can you sc scroll back up? Or having a joint mechanism. Oh, that looks like a good one. Forming effective management committee and intercommittee discussions, and joint plan of action. Great. Yes, I like this. I like this one in particular. Having a joint mechanism for identification, planning, and delivering of climate adaptation interventions. I just, I, I think that's, I think that's gets to the heart of what we're talking about in terms of uh, collaboration and convergence of mechanisms. But it's just how does this joint mechanism set up? Set up? Is that set up at the national government level? I would argue probably not. Um, transparency, accountability. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great. These are these are great, and thank you for contributing. Um, I think cause we are kind of pressed for time. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. But I think, but these are some of the issues that definitely keep in the back of your mind because we're going to be discussing these um, in the group work after the presentations. But I think we probably just in the interest of time, we probably need to move on. Uh, so if we if if we could move on to the First presentation, I think. I believe it's um, it's Johnny. If you could just move it on for us, that'd be great. Sorry, bear with us. As you know, doing online meetings, everything takes just that little bit longer. But I think we're doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. Are we, are we okay to move on? Um, yes, so can you see the slide? 
Uh, no, we can still see the no. Mentimeter. There we go. Okay, Johnny, I, I'm going to pass over. Do you want to just give yourself a super quick introduction? Uh, quicker than I did. Uh, sorry, uh, longer than I did. And then we could just move on. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Barry. And good afternoon and good morning. And everyone participating in this uh, uh, conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to do this uh, presentation and interact with all of you. I am Johnny Zapata. I work in the forest and farm facility uh, based in uh, FAO in Rome. And I will talk about some experience about associative mecha mechanisms for commercialization from forest and farm producer organization. So uh, could we move to the next slide, please? And um, we uh, work in, uh, so we are a partnership uh, between uh, FAO, IIED, IUCN, and AgriCorp. And now we are in our uh, second phase. Um, we are a multi donor trust fund uh, funded by uh, Sweden, Germany, Finland, IKEA, EU Flecti, the Netherlands, and we have uh, about uh, 20 million. US dollar and our funds are mo mainly to uh, strengthening producer organizations. Our funds goes directly to the bank account of the producer organization. So what we want to do is um, strengthening the capacities on, of the producer organization that they become uh, active agent, aid, agents of change for um, two things happening at the same time that uh, that climate resilience landscapes where they live and also at the same time improve livelihoods. Uh, we focus in, in four outcomes. Uh, one uh, talks about the um, strengthening the governance of the producer organization, the strong multi cross sectoral uh, um, platforms to enabling policies uh, in favor of the producer organizations. And another one is about uh, strengthening the entrepreneurship, access to finance on markets uh, from the producer organization through inclusive value chains, business incubation, and therefore uh, more investment and, and finance for the uh, producer organization. And our third outcome talks about the increase the delivery on the ground of these um, activities related to uh, climate change with the producer organizations at the center of this uh, delivery. And, uh, and, uh, and our last outcome is uh, about the uh, social and cultural services going to the members of producer organizations, a uh, channel or delivered by the um, forest and farm producer organization. Um, for uh, doing that, we have three uh, mainstreaming issues. One is, um, um, gender equality, inclusion of youth, and also um, indigenous people. Um, we actually are um, working in, in 10 countries, which are in, in uh, Asia, Nepal, Vietnam. In Africa, we work in uh, Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, and uh, Madagascar, and Togo, and Tanzania. And in Latin America, we have Ecuador and Bolivia. And we have also network countries. Um, and today I will present briefly um, the, our experience about the commercialization mechanisms. Could we move to the next slide, please? So all uh, that I have talked about the forest and farm facility is uh, to strengthen in producer organizations. Here I will present so an, um, commercialization mechanisms for um, a basket of products from an, an union of producers in, uh, in Cotacachi in Ecuador. So um, what um, we have uh, done is strengthening their commercialization um, mechanisms during this uh, COVID or because this COVID. You could see in the down in the in the slide, uh, we provide the uh, initial support from the forest and farm facility to these mechanisms. So what they have done is um, they have made and, and put together a manual for the manage, management of this uh, commercialization fund. 
So they have a regulation uh, for this uh, community fair trade under this um, participatory guarantee system that uh, assures that the, all the products are coming from uh, funds, from smallholders. Uh, and they do all this um, biosecurity protocol for this COVID. These are the institutional arrangements. So what we have is that before this um, support is a, a value chain where there were uh, 3,000 uh, producers which are producing many kinds of forest and farm products. So the gathering and distribution and commercialization was done by the middleman. So the, uh, because of the lack of, 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 of funding, the liquidity, the middleman uh, paid the, um, for, for the products in the farm to the producers and, and, and he or she gather and go to the, uh, to the market. So, and then the consumption by the uh, end users. So what uh, this mechanism does is that um, direct purchase from the, from the farmers in the farm um, and they part uh, the all agroforestry products um, that they, they have for, for offering and at the market. And uh, we, start, we have started to work uh, with one producer uh, every week. As I have mentioned before, UNORCA has 3,300. It's a big potential to scale up also inside the UNORCA. And uh, these um, producers, they have an area more or less of 30,000 hectares uh, of um, landscape. Um, so the uh, UNORCA has realized that each producer more or less for the, for the, um, uh, for the needs the, of the family, each producer family needs $40, uh, $40 per week. What is that they pay uh, in the farm every week to the producers? So, and uh, what the UNORCA does and do with this commercialization mechanism, is they prepare the basket of products. They consolidate this basket and they offer baskets of five, 10 and 15 uh, US dollar to the end user. So the end users are uh, your, uh, urban families. Um, so, and, and they do also the delivery and they charge $1 per uh, delivery to the end, end user. So, and the, um, the money is paid to the UNORCA uh, by the families, they go to the bank account to the UNORCA, to the producer organization, and they pay the whole um, money after that to the producer who have provided the, um, the, the products. So, and um, every week, more or less, the, the money that they uh, do, do because of the delivery is $100. Two, $20 is for covering the cost of the delivery. And this $80, which is only because of the delivery, goes to this uh, commercialization mechanism. So it is uh, something that uh, has been happening in the last uh, three and four months, and it is uh, going very well. So. And uh, we could go to the, please, to the next slide. Uh, it's about um, a mechanism um, from uh, Kenya. Again, this is 30,000 uh, producers. Before there was a middleman who paid uh, the directly to the producers and, they, uh, and he or she went to the market or to the buyers. Now with these mechanisms, uh, there is an up from payment of 2% of the total value of the stock paid by the, by the producer organizations. And uh, every week, um, 100 each uh, dollar receives the producers and five producers per week sell their products. 2% of the total value uh, sold uh, is paid by the uh, buyer. It is uh, called the producer buyer linkages. And um, more or less, uh, each producer sells 5,000 US dollars, a total of 25,000 dollars. At the end, uh, the, the organization receives 500 dollars per week because of this week, of this fee. And this uh, is for the, um, for the mechanism. I would say, um, as, uh, to, to finalize this, is that um, investment in strengthening the capacities of local producer organizations can deliver 
sustained improvements of rural livelihoods, also boost uh, recovery from COVID, COVID, and also build long-term uh, uh, resilience. And also, as you can see, that local stronger producer organization businesses uh, can uh, leverage further finance and also uh, funding their own operations and with their own profit. And this is a proof a big potential to be at the same time transformational and also sustainable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johnny, for, for that presentation. Um, you do emphasize the aggregation at different levels. I like that you speak uh, that the farmer forest, that, that speaks about multi donor partnerships. So at that level, you have aggregation of donor funding but you focus on partnership that helps build capacities at the local levels. I think that is also important and it came out very critically yesterday during the, <coughs> the opening ceremony that we need to focus um, at the local level. We need to listen to the local people and build their capacities so it is uh, impressive that the project does pay a lot of attention in building the capacities and especially in aggregating um, the producers producers at the level and cutting out the middleman. I think we 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 need that to see to to see a lot more scale. Um, so everyone, it's it's time for questions, and I will request that. Uh, if you have any question for Johnny, please put it in the chat room. We do have a question already for you, Johnny. Um, it says, how do, you, how do you get the right price for the produce? Um, can, can you speak to that? And uh, did, did, in terms of numbers, when you speak about the farmers, the producers that are aggregated, uh, is it for example, the three, is it 3,000 in Kenya? And if you do an aggregate for all the 10 countries, how many are we speaking about? Let's start with that. Over to you, Johnny. Yeah, uh, thank you. The aggregation is done by the producer organization. In the case of Kenya, is the uh, um, Tree Growers Association of Nyandarwa. The price is done by the market. Uh, and um, the, the producer organization is just the aggregator of the products and the market has a price. And uh, before this, um, uh, the difference between the, the, the price paid by the market and the price that uh, paid to the producer organization was for the middleman. Now is for the uh, producer organization. And on the top of that, because the, the, the buyers know that they are small holders, they are ready to pay 2% for these linkages from uh, smallholder producers to the buyers. And they, uh, and they pay for each, uh, in, on the top of the price, they pay 2%. So um, again, we, we don't put the prices, the, the prices are, are, are from the market. And the producers are able to, to meet uh, these uh, prices. Okay. Um, Joshi from Nepal is asking what products are produced and marketed in Nepal. Okay. Want to speak to that, Johnny? Sorry, I, I didn't get the question. Um, so Joshi is, is asking from Nepal uh, which particular products are produced in Nepal through this project. Um, well, our producers in, in Nepal, because uh, in, we work with a big organization in, in Nepal, uh, and is, 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 is the biggest uh, producer organization in Nepal. They produce many things in their farm, but this kind of commercialization mechanism we have not yet established in, in Nepal. And 
is is a fund, FECO fund in 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 Nepal, the um, producer organization. Okay, and we have a question from Nila. She's asking, oh, I don't know if it's a she. Um, what are the key activities under local people capacity building? Can you break down the capacity building that you offer? Yeah. Mm. Well, first is the the, um, the uh, building the self esteem of the people that they believe that they could do, that not necessary an intermediary and middleman is is needed, that they could do themselves, that the strength is in the numbers that they have. Uh, are there other thing is this bargain power because they are a lot of people in the case of Ecuador this producer was the 3000 producers for from produce coming for 30000 hectares it's a lot of um, area before they were isolated scattered and weak but now with self steam and the figures other thing that I forgot to mention in in, in Kenya is that now they are selling wood products because this is done with the inventory that they have sales done. So we have do, done a, a training of trainers on, for producers, 22 young people were trained and these were training in a cascade until the 3000 members of the three growers of uh, association of Nyandarwa could have their own uh, census of the, the products that they have in their farm. So at that point, east of the products, but also the association. And that is a big power in the hand on the, of the producer organization. Before, the information was done by drones or by computers, uh, by programs uh, and uh, by the government which are good, but now the information is in the hands of the producer organization. They know what they have, and also they know the market. So and that is a, a, a big, big difference. So it is, it is uh, the, the start of the, of, the, uh, um, uh, of the sustainability. Um, it looks like, I'm afraid Susan looks like she's been kicked out of the meeting, um, but in the interest of time, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Uh, but what I would say is, please do, I know, I know there's additional questions and my apologies that we couldn't get to them, uh, but seek out Johnny on the, uh, on the HOVA app, uh, and that's probably the best way to engage uh, there, and then you can sort of you can continue the discussion. Uh, Egley, can we get the slides back up and then I'm going yeah. to ask Moses um, if you are ready to go and then we will have your presentation and then similarly we'll have a five minute moderated Q&A afterwards and please do, uh, as any questions occur to you, please do type them in the chat box and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Okay, thank you. Just bear with us while we get the slides. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning. And in some area, uh, regions, good afternoon. Um, Moses Kakanu, working at the Adel Sofala. Adel Sofala is a, a national NGO in Mozambique. Uh, it's a Agency that is movement economic local in Portuguese, but uh, in English it's a local economic development agency. We spearhead local economic development in its, its serious sense. And ADEL is the development approach of the United Nations. It's a school of thought how um, a local community can be developed. So um, for the purpose of today's presentation, we take it from one of our main thematic themes, but it's also cross-cutting, that's microfinance. And in this case, we are looking at uh, accumulating savings and credit uh, associations methodology, which is called ASCA. Um, ASCA is, um, is a financial inclusion approach for the poor people. 
because normally they are included they are excluded from the formal financial services and therefore the approach of village saving and loans associations helps them a lot to get on board also to tap into the the benefits of access to finance can we go to the next slide the objective of uh, ashka is to promote the creation and development of local economic activities allowing the generation of incomes and self-employment in families but also in communities and uh, also contribute to inclusive and sustainable local development in the rural areas. I've already hinted slightly on that. So these are um, the two principal objectives that we work, we work along or we work on. Can we go to another slide? Yeah, these, these are some of the steps we go through to mobilize and create a village saving group. Uh, they, they may not be uh, in order, but uh, roughly they are, they are the steps. The first step is to mobilize the local communities uh, through their local structures, their local leaders um, to, to form groups. And then after that, we have a training package that includes um, working in group, which we call assistivism, uh, leadership, conflict resolution, small business management, and then savings and credit. At the end of this training, it is normally a three-day training. That's, that's when the, the group, uh, all the, 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 the participants come into a group. And at that point, they give themselves a name for their group and they start to work on um, internal regulations, how, how they will be governed. They have a small uh, statute. Um, they start to save. And uh, until now, our, save, uh, our credit rate or what is called the, 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 the interest, 10% per month. And then we also have an approach for sustainability or, or to attach a promoter is a, lo a local person in the community to the group, see that they are saving, they are doing proper records and so on. And then, um, as, they, as the group starts to save, there is money at their disposal. So those who are already doing business, they improve their business. They increase their capital. Those who are not yet, they start their, uh, doing business. And then we, the next step is to support them. In most cases, uh, uh, people in the rural, rural communities in Mozambique, they don't have the necessary documentation to have um, a bank account or to have a mobile money account. There are documents that are required. So uh, the agency supports them to, uh, because the agency already works with authorities like the tributaria, which is the revenue services or the revenue authority to issue the NUIT and also other authorities to issue the, the, nation, the national ID, which, which then facilitates them to open accounts. And then uh, we have built relationships with a number of agencies, like I've already mentioned, uh, the revenue services, the revenue authority, banks, and authorities that issue national IDs, just to facilitate them to, to be documented and then to open accounts. Can we go to the next slide? Until now, we as the agency, we have supported over 
340 groups that benefits over 10,000 uh, people. And these, all these groups have been linked to, to banks. They have accounts. Uh, outside of that, there are also uh, individuals, individuals that have also been assisted and they, they, are also, they also have accounts. They are doing their business, they, they, they move money, uh, and uh, they use money, they deposit money, they, they, they use the account in, in this sense. Uh, uh, on a minimum, we are saying that uh, uh, between the groups, there is movement for over 410,000 uh, USD in the movement in these uh, in these rural saving groups so it is it is quite a reasonable amount of money that is available that is moving around that is facilitating rural people to and also to be part of the national economy and also to to feel that uh, yes they, they 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 are part of the, the mozambique uh, economy uh, next slide Yeah, okay. The last slide is just about our, 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 our contacts as an agency and also to show part, some of our, our activities that we do. We do the improved stoves uh, for, for, for energy saving, uh, among uh, uh, other activities. So, um, thank you. Maybe we can go into, um, into questions but uh, briefly that's what we had to present thank you thank you very much moses uh, that was great um so we have a question from ibrahim uh, from wwf uganda he is asking how is credit handled in the group to limit cases of members defaulting on loans yeah thank you yeah. As I, I hinted on, there is an internal regulation, it's small, small laws, they, where, where if there is a time agreed to return money with interest, if, if a member uh, faults on that, there are remed remedies in place also for, to, to, minimize, to minimize. But we, on average, we think that out of a group of 30 people, you find the 45 or 35 uh, failing, failing to, re to return to group, group funds. Okay, thank you. Um, so a question from Anne uh, from WWF Netherlands. Uh, how do the activities undertaken in the small businesses contribute to climate adaptation deal with climate impact and environmental sustainability. Yeah, thank you. Um, at, the, at the beginning, uh, we, uh, we never mentioned our partnerships, but uh, we are happy that uh, we, we are into this, uh, this project with the IID, WWF, IUCN, which has also been supporting us to document our, what we do. Um, for most part of this year. Thank you very, very much, I, IID, WWF, and IUCN. Yeah, so uh, what happened is, is that the, 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 the loans or the saving groups, the money available helps a lot these, uh, these families. For example, if there is any shock, like Mozambique last year had the, the, the passing of Cyclone Idai, for our case in central Mozambique, uh, and then the later floods. So there is a fallback. There is a cushion in terms of these disasters. The, the groups have something to start instead of uh, being uh, starting from zero. They, they, they have a saving which is stored away in a bank or in a, a mobile uh, a mobile money account, and when, when there is a need, they fall, they fall back, they use that to, 
to, to push on, to go in front, instead of uh, being uh, in, their, in their state. We have seen this in, 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 the, in the past disasters. And our, and our groups that are in the saving and loans were really different, coped better than people or families that were not in the, in, 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 in the groups, for example. Great, we've got a heap of questions coming through and I'm just going to read out one, I'm going to read out two more and then we can move on. But again, uh, please do engage on the HOVA app, on the community boards, um, arrange a virtual meetup, uh, and then we'll be recording the questions here so we can pass them on. Um, so another question is, how are such initiatives helping to face the COVID crisis as well as climate change? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, oh, of course, at the start of COVID, it was very difficult because, um, because of the restrictions from government. Uh, uh, the government reduced the number of people to come together. We had a state of emergency, in other words, and uh, reduced the number of people that come together in a meeting to 10. So it, it affected, you know, these are people who sit every week and there are 15, 20, 30 people. So if you, if you are telling them that they should only meet 10, they are already affected. Um, but either way, they have been able to cope uh, through us, we have supported them, our prom through our promoters, the promoters have supported them to continue. We have not had a lot of uh, dropouts even during this this time of COVID, this the saving has continued, and also the, to to borrow has has continued. But of course, it they were affected because um, the, because of the numbers being allowed to to come together at any even sitting. Okay, uh, one final question, uh, and I think this gets right to the heart of the matter for this session, is how can these approaches reach greater scale? Do the small groups have any services and support to manage risk? For example, economic risk or COVID risk or such like? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, how they can reach greater scale. One, it's a, a community-based approach through uh, local promoters, so it is low cost. The promoter will, from time to time, uh, create more saving groups. Okay, so it is a low-cost uh, kind of approach. It requires little investment. The promoters are there; they are trained, they have the capacity, and they can replicate. They can create more groups. That's one. Two, the groups at at maturity, we link them. To, um, to, to banks or to, to micro finance institutions. So they become small micro enterprises. And we are seeing some of them even becoming, uh, having enough money, which they can even, enough funds, which they can also start to lend out to others, apart from providing credit, credit, credit to, to the members, so it, it, it's a it is it's low cost. It is replicate. Uh, it can be replicated in any kind of uh, in any kind of any kind any kind of any kind of situation, any kind of condition. It's a global a, a global financial inclusion approach. Great. I know I said that was the last question, but I, d I just spotted one which I quite like. Uh, and then we'll move on because we are. So very quick, Moses, because uh, we are a little bit behind. Um, what is the composition in terms of gender of the different groups? Uh, from our experience, we work with 70% uh, female, uh, the rest being, being men. And uh, that has uh, also helped a lot in terms of uh, uh, devolution, uh, people borrowing and then returning. Because normally we have, from experience, we have seen that women see yes, they take the, the, the loans, but they are 
very willing and very concerned to return the group, the group money. So we have, we have, on average, we have 70% 70, 70 women. Great. Great. Okay, uh, we need to move on now in the interest of time. Uh, so I'm giving you a virtual clap and I'm going to invite Rebecca from Acumen to present. Egley, if you could get our slides up, please. Hi everyone, just a quick audio check. Can you hear me okay, Barry? Yes, yeah. Great. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, for joining. My name is Rebecca Mincy and I am the investment director for uh, Acumen. I sit in Nairobi and um, I bring you greetings from Nairobi from wherever you are in the world. Um, I will do my best to, to keep time, um, but I wanted to just start by uh, telling you a little bit about Acumen and then transitioning to the uh, partnership that we have with the Green, Com Green Climate Fund. Uh, next slide. So Acumen is a nonprofit organization um, that uses investing as a means to catalyze efficient and sustainable ways of solving poverty. We are looking to develop the right type of capital, the right type of company, and the right entrepreneurs needed to tackle the world's biggest problems. When we first started Acumen in 2001, we understood the power of capital for good um, and that it would require a different type of investor who aligned values with objectives and for whom financial returns were not the ultimate or the only measure of success. And over the last 18 years, we've seen incredible growth in what is now called the impact investing sector with new funds emerging and traditional players raising impact capital. For this, we follow two strategies. We have an early stage uh, capital strategy, allocation strategy where we use philanthropy to invest in and refine business models. Um, and we also have a commercially backed early growth strategy um, that brings more mature startups to um, companies that help the poor to scale and companies that want to do it profitably. Um, since we first started, Acumen has invested more than $125 million across 14 companies. Um, we've impacted over a quarter of a million lives, and um, half of which those lives fall below the poverty line. Next slide. Specifically, um, as it relates to agriculture, which is why we're here, um, we've been working for um, to promote, to develop and promote a sustainable way of tackling poverty. Um, this has not been easy. We have learned a lot across all of the sectors in which we invest. And just for clarification, we invest in agriculture, housing, energy, health, water and sanitation, as well as education. Um, our approach aims to take the core, princi core principles of capitalism, uh, customer centricity, innovation, financial sustainability, and scalability, and we combine that with the moral motives of philanthropy. We believe that this is one of the most effective ways to approach scale and sustainability for these initiatives. Um, so today's conversation will be about Acumen's work in agriculture and specifically our partnership with the Green Climate Fund. But prior to this partnership, we had a multi-regional focus for agriculture that included supporting a wide range of business models. And that included ag tech, it included financial services, it included input companies and aggregator uh, companies. And as you might have guessed, we learned a lot of lessons along the way um, that deeply informed our strategy for the Acumen Resilient Agriculture Initiative uh, with the Green Climate Fund. Next slide. We started investing in inputs and soon realized that just investing in inputs um, like high quality seeds or perhaps irrigation pumps really did not alleviate the challenges that farmers were facing. Um, and it actually did very little to improve incomes. Farmers still faced expensive credit, no training, and little access to market. Um, so these issues required our attention as investors. And so then we moved towards a strategy to better integrate farmers into um, local and global supply chains. And so through these early investments, what we've learned is the importance of working, of supporting companies that provide farmers with a bundle set of solutions. So think not just inputs, but inputs and credit, um, or um, not just market access, but hyperlocal weather information, um, as well as market access. 
and we believe and we've learned that these platform models actually provide a holistic set of services while also serving as a commercially viable service delivery mechanism that reduces customer acquisition costs for the companies that we invest in. Next slide. And so for the collaboration that we have with the Green Climate Fund, we focus on investing in companies that help smallholder farmers adapt to climate change in both East and West Africa. And we expect to impact the lives of 10 million people. With absolutely catalytic support from the Green Climate Fund, we have been able to leverage values aligned commercial investors um, to support startups that are on their path to scale. As early stage impact investors, we are aware of the tensions that exist between achieving impact as well as financial returns. And we manage these tensions through careful portfolio construction, but also through innovative uh, incentive structures that consider social and environmental performance standards. Um, just for a bit of uh, context, um, our investment time horizon is usually seven to 10 years and our um, entry, entry investments amounts, uh, investment amounts are usually between one and $3 million. Our strategy for the Acumen Resilient Agriculture Initiative builds upon our learnings of investing in platform businesses and we categorize them with three pillars. We invest in ag tech platforms um, that provide supply chain solutions, information services, and online marketplaces. We also invest in ag finance companies that provide agriculture insurance and savings products and broad digital financial platforms. And then finally, we invest in what we call aggregator platforms, but you can think of them as supply chain platforms that seek to make an entire supply chain more resilient to changes in climate. Um, we also want those platforms, those um, supply chain platforms, to include a clear market linkage strategy to premium markets for high value crops. In addition to this investment work that I've laid out, we are also measuring the impact of our work and the climate resilience of farmers um, over time. Um, and we will share those best practices within our portfolio as well as to the larger climate adaptation community. To date, we've made three investments. We just got started at the end of 2019. Um, so to date, we've made three investments in the horticulture, dairy, and water sectors in both East and West Africa. And we expect uh, these companies to scale and serve millions of customers over the next seven to 10 years, while also delivering a financial return to investors and improving the adaptive ability of farmers to withstand and even thrive um, during changes, um, changes in climate. So those are my those are my remarks, and I'm very very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, fantastic. Um, thank you very much. Okay, let's move to the discussion. So, um, first question comes from uh, Sundip, and the question is. What alternative entrepreneurship models can be adopted in South Asia for developing producers, centered supply chains and linkages with marketplaces? So alternatives, I would say that um, one of the, some of the alternatives that we are looking at, particularly in our, in our Latin America portfolio, um, are, are um, business models that actually, we call them inclusive business models. And what that means for us is that um, we're looking at companies that are working very closely with cooperatives, for example, um, who actually give the farmers an ownership stake in the business um, so that they um, can see income growth, so that they can see um, asset and, and wealth accumulation over time um, alongside of Acumen's investment in that particular company. And so we're seeing more and more of these pop up because cooperatives are essentially um, really a standard in a lot of countries in order to aggregate smallholder farmer demand um, as well as use this uh, these um, um, these uh, larger numbers of farmers to um, be able to leverage um, stronger and more I would say equitable relationships with off takers as well as input suppliers so I would say um, models that could work outside of East and West Africa um, what we're learning is that some of those that really deeply leverage the um, the cooperative model are are quite are, are quite interesting innovative um, and have the um, the sustainability component um, that we're always looking for it and what happens in the case where a venture is not performing as expected 
<laughs> so it happens all the time. First of all, Barry, let me just say that there is no investment that's perfect. When we go into, when we make an investment decision, we are well aware of the risks um, and we make certain assumptions about the market and the entrepreneurs, et cetera. But inevitably things go wrong. Um, look, we tend to take a, um, a very active uh, role in the company. So we tend to sit on the board either as a voting, bo voting board member and we also tend to um, be very active um, with providing, and I didn't mention this, um, technical assistance and technical assistance um, can take the shape of um, everything from additional farmer training, um, providing um, right now for a company, we are actually working with them to in, uh, do a, to fund an experiment to increase outgrower outgrower yields relative to their model farm yields. Um, so we do our best along the way to support the company from a governance standpoint, um, from a strategy standpoint, as well as um, from a technical assistance standpoint to assume that, um, to support um, its its growth. If it doesn't happen, um, you know, it's we, we have a lot of learnings um, and we apply those learning to the rest of our portfolio. And of course we share um, our, our hits and our misses uh, with the larger community. Um, and a question from uh, Lalmani is, could you please elaborate on the insurance? What types of risks uh, are covered and what is the mechanism to cover the risk? Yep. So what type of risk are covered? It really depends on the company. Um, we certainly look at whether, um, so, so typically there's two broadly speaking types of insurance, um, both of which we are interested in investing in. The first one is um, where you are, um, if, the, if the rains don't come um, and you have taken out inputs on credit, then you no longer um, are responsible for that loan. Um, or if you've purchased inputs and those inputs have an insurance mechanism attached to it, then you'll get the money back that you spent on, on those inputs. One thing that we really like are basically um, insurance uh, mechanisms that provide um, a recourse if you, if you um, um, for all the anticipated income that you would have expected, um, but actually didn't materialize. So those covers are um, super exciting, but a bit more expensive than what some farmers are interested in in, in paying. Um, but those are roughly speaking the models and they cover everything from uh, weather, um, certainly uh, pestilence. Um, I haven't seen any COVID covers yet, um, but they usually tend to be pretty exhaustive when it comes to um, um, climate related, related issues. Um, and then the second one, what is the mechanism of covering it? Um, I'm not sure that I, I, under, I understand that question. It's a typical insurance mechanism. The pricing is done in advance, the farmers pay the premium. And more often than not, what we're seeing across East and West Africa is that governments are subsidizing uh, smallholder farmer insurance, um, not only because it de-risks farming, um, but what it also does is that it helps, um, even from an aid standpoint, a lot of money can tends to be routed for food security. Um, um, and what many governments are thinking is that and if they can provide um, additional support um, in the way of, 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 of insurance, then less aid will be required to address food security concerns on a, on a long-term basis and more aid, if necessary, can be directed towards perhaps other initiatives that are equally important to a government like education, for example. Uh, and a question uh, from Linda on uh, process it's regarding measuring resilience. How do you do it? Do you sure. also do a baseline to measure change and what framework do you use and what proxies are you using for measuring? Yeah, no, thank you for that. So we are working with a company called 60 Decibels um, and what 60 Decibels has done um, is that they've created a climate resilient toolkit. And basically that toolkit outlines the metrics and the exact questions that we will be um, quite uh, um, asking and those questions are calibrated to a score um, and that score ranges from vulnerable all the way to buoyant um, as a measure of resilience and so as soon as we make an investment within the first hundred days of having made that investment we collect baseline data and then we'll be collecting that baseline data on climate resilience um, every 18 to 24 months um, in order to see if to, to establish do our best to establish this causality um, is, is this particular company, are farmers working with this particular company helping to improve um, the resilience of smallholder farmers over time? And these are the, these are the metrics. So this was a bespoke 
um, internally, I guess, contracted toolkit that was specifically created for um, the Acumen Resilient Agriculture Initiative to measure changes in climate resilience over time. Right. Uh, final question, super simple. Uh, are you able to share that toolkit? <laughs> no, right, not 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 yet. Um, maybe maybe after we kind of work through it a bit. But it was it's a proprietary toolkit that was created just for us. Okay, great. Okay, uh, Susan, are you in the call? I know that you have been having difficulties. Uh, if you're not, I will move us on. You there? Okay, great. I'm good. And um, thank you so much, Barry, for uh, picking it up. Um, Lynn, would you please uh, post Egley post the slides? Okay, thank you for a very insightful discussion so far. Would like now to take it to groups. And we have set up a few questions to, as Ignite questions or guiding questions. Um, okay, Egli, I... Okay, I'll just move on. Um, so we are really running out of time, but would like to have you engage um, around these questions. There are three, and looking at the number of participants we have, we, we have about 50 people on the call. And um, we, we will be splitting you to, into five groups and we request that you, as you, you, as soon as you start, you find a facilitator in the breakout room. Please nominate a person who will report back on your conversation. Um, consider each question. Get as far as you can into the, in the question, but given the time constraints, um, we recommend that you have Uh, a few to the plenary so that we start teasing out our our key messages for this session so i'm not going to read these questions they are going to be posted in each of your breakout groups and egli is going to set us up into the groups um just so you know um once the time the, the time is about to end you will get get a notice of one minute and either you click on it uh on the prompt that comes to your screen to get back to plenary or it will automatically bring you back okay um Egli, are we ready to launch into the groups please um yes okay excellent take us in we have a maximum of 22 minutes to go so we're going to be in the groups for 20 minutes and we'll return and try to wrap up with within 10 minutes thereafter um okay here we go Support on the mainstreaming of uh community-based adaptation initiatives uh in the national policies uh, the, 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 this thing should need to be addressed start from, uh, from the post level to the plans and the local plans. And also, I think also the other issue I think is we, know to, we need to ensure the accessibility of financial support uh, to ensure that the community based adaptation are well implemented and that was the need of the local people. And also, we need also focus on how we can build on the capacity of local organizations and the communities. And if possible, also we need also to ensure that how we can implement community-based adaptation at the community level and the, and the creating a learning points where community will be able to have access to, uh, for learnings and they use the lesson to, to upscale the, the CBA initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so yes, this is very important uh, what we were talking about, that the communities definitely uh, need to be integrated more and we have to develop some mechanisms that can actually help to deliver this finance at the community level, whether we talk about this local adaptation or CBA. Okay, so now we have Ati Khabdivi. You, you want to talk about this? Hello. Um, hello, yes, I, uh, I would like to type. 
Uh, I would like to talk about um, the number three question. Um, I think one of the most uh, important uh, barriers regarding to scaling up financial climate finance for adaptation in, uh, at local level is related to monitoring and evaluation of the um, of the uh, delivering uh, financial support. So we need a national system for uh, for tracking and monitoring um, financial resources, uh, especially in the re recipient uh, countries, uh, because. Um, uh, the lack of available data related to the uh, financial resources uh, would be, um, I think, would be a, um, would be a most important barrier. And if we have um, a great and valuable uh, data related to financial resources, so we can, um, the, the government can invest invest, in, invest more uh, on the local level. And uh, the other action, which is really important. Um, uh, in this regard is related to youth inclusion and women inclusion, especially in the local level. And if you we, if we would like to, um, to realize the needs of uh, vulnerable people, we have to include um, a youth people and uh, a women group. Uh, and we can ask them to, for example, go through the local community and ask the other people about their needs related to climate adaptation by providing questionnaire or interviewing with local people and then we can uh, um, we can uh, raise our voice to the local uh, to the government uh, by uh, by using youths in people and women to scale up uh, financial support uh, in future yes yes i guess that's a very important point which you just you raised like we need to include this uh, female women groups and the youth in the mechanism and definitely the monitoring and evaluation is very important like from the perspective of bangladesh if i want to share like yes there, there is a big lag in terms of this monitoring the climate funds and also like the transparency and accountability has been one of the major issue in our country as well to reach to the local level so yes, I guess that's a very important point we should take into account. Okay, so um, who, who wants to share something next? Um, can I request Sally if you want to share something from your experience or your country? How, what's the condition in your place? Hi, I'm, Hi. I'm, I am, it's been really interesting hearing what everyone's thinking, but, um, and I'm not sure exactly uh, from my side, I've been trying to think of just one main action. And I think there are so many different things that will need to be done. Um, and uh, so I guess from my perspective, um, I work mainly on the sort of international policy process international level um, so I was thinking about the sort of enabling conditions at that level and I think it there's something around um, how we um, think about risk and um, the sort of how we address kind of financial risk and I think um, perhaps a sort of change in in mindset and in policy regulations um, around risks when, for example, it's, um, I guess that the amount of funding that is required at that local level is much smaller than those kind of really huge um, funding pots that are given out by the GCF, for example. Um, and maybe when they're given out at such, you know, smaller amounts of money, the kind of the level of risk needs to be much, uh, the level of regulation around it needs to be greatly reduced um but i'm not sure exactly how to create that change in but the... i guess your thought really counts that that's a lot right we can <laughs> of course based on that hi linda we can see you hi 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 just a, a short intervention before um i have to leave to another meeting i just wanted to reflect just generally about adaptation funding um so i um, I sit in and work now in Finland. Normally I, I'm out and about in the world, but now due to Corona, I'm, I'm sitting here uh, in my home base. That's and okay. um, um, 
I think um, financial institutions that are part of their mandate is to, to finance adaptation just in, uh, in general, they're really challenged because of the fact that adaptation is always um, place and context specific. So it's much more complicated than mitigation uh, where you, you have the same proxies uh, across the world that you're always looking at and tracking. So suddenly you, you know, proxies, there's so many different proxies you have to look at and um, their changes. Um, so I think um, just I'm ref reflecting just in general, it's if you want to know that you're actually creating change you will need to do some sort of baseline. And normally donors are a bit, well, their baseline costs money. So <laughs> yes. I guess it's, it's, it's um, also, we can't really get around that. We will have to, to do baseline assessments and they're expensive. So um, I guess that's part of, of of number two uh, of the constraints. I think um, perhaps an action point then related to point three is that we, I think, and I, I guess that would be interested to hear your opinions among the rest of the group. What do you think? Do we need baselines? Um, I guess I think we need, um, and I think it's, it's going to be more expensive than mitigation uh, support because because of partly because of 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 that baseline need and because we all always need to adjust it adjust the the the, the activities so i guess one one uh, one point to address that is that there needs to be a, a general recognition of the needs of the specific needs of adaptation um, finance that it needs to be tailored and it's you can't just have a blueprint and it will cost money and that's just it yeah i just so would like to add something here like we always talk about the bottom-up approach we can hear so much about this everywhere but in practical how much bottom-up actions actually are we taking that's that's kind of uh, that's also a very big question from my side i often find it very uh, yes, yeah, very difficult. So yes, but thank you so much, Linda. Uh, can we hear uh, from Mr. Nabin? Uh, what's your opinion in terms of these three questions? Would you like to add something? Okay, so I guess it's time to leave the breakout room, but okay, so let's get back to the plenary uh, within one minute and we will uh, hear more about from the other groups. So uh, for the last few seconds, uh, Cesar, do you want to share something? Uh, I know you were already busy by taking the notes, but if you would like to say something about this queries or questions? Um, I, I'm not sure. I haven't really uh, had a chance. All right, to... no problem. Okay, so when we get into the plenary, maybe you just share one or two points. Uh, that 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 would be great. Sure. Or would anyone else like to share from the uh, notes document? Um, if anyone wants to feedback, uh, please do so. Hello, okay. Sarah. We had a great discussion, so yes, looking forward to all of you. Awesome. Now that we have 50 participants, I think let's kick off. Um, I'm going to request that the people that are going to report back, you kindly raise your hand so I will know who to invite um, to report back. 
Um, I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host, but I'm, I'm happy to report back when you're ready. Excellent. Now you go first. <laughs> okay, so I was with a, a, a group facilitated by Johnny. Um, so enabling conditions to support the scale up. We talked about, uh, 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 Brat talks about having relationships with donors that enable to give them more flexibility. Uh, so that they were not limited by conditionality but we also had a, a interesting comment that indigenous knowledge and local knowledge was really important to scaling up effectively and having mechanisms that bridge the local knowledge into an institutionalized mechanism uh, and other enabling conditions involved uh, being well networked so uh, the example of community forest user groups networked into a, a national central committee with regular meetings to coordinate uh, and having joint action plans between them was also really important um, we also it, moving on to constraining factors we we noted that one of the things to be aware of is that local cohesion and social cohesion is really important for resilience building and if you have a mechanism that focuses only on maximizing profit or maximizing income then you're going to miss the requirements for collective responsibility that are absolutely necessary for for resilience and that has to be so overcoming that constraining factor is is not forgetting the social side, that the social cohesion is really important for the whole of society approach. Uh, and somebody also mentioned the lack of capacity and knowledge in identifying climate change impacts um, and weak documentation of traditional indigenous solutions is another constraining factor. Uh, moving on to one main action, unfortunately, we, we didn't all settle on one, we had quite a few. So we noted good policy, particularly delivering climate finance at scale to the local level, um, and the, again, the importance of local collective organizations, so working with existing systems that are there, but working uh, uh, to enhance the role of local collective organizations. Um, now, these might be different depending on contract context. You might be talking about cooperatives, you might be talking about associations, um, but uh, 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 trying to network with those was seen, I think, came up quite strongly as a good key action. And, Whoever is the rapporteur, I've got more notes that I can share with you uh, um, after the session. Thanks. Yes, that would be Thanks, great. Sam. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Um, I, I'll not recap on any because of time, but I think um, so many issues uh, converging with where what we discussed as well. So let me invite Anne from WWF to share from Group 4. Yeah. So a few thoughts from our group work. It was uh, facilitated by yourself, Suzu. Um, so uh, on the enabling conditions, what we're seeing as crucial is the organization of communities, but also the backup uh, of national governments, as in the insurance example of Acumen, as well as local level policies that have to create enabling and conditions. Uh, the challenges are um, also in the long-term view that is of climate change and the decisions that need to be made there it's not matching short-term decisions that smaller stakeholders and local actors are dealing with so there needs to be a translation of uh, what it means in short term um and it's well the challenge of the whole of society is also to include uh, the landless that we did not have the or the perfect solution to uh but when you look at solutions you're talking about uh, an organization at local level, uh, you use the term collectivization or um, creating cooperatives where people organize and jointly um, are able to access finance and uh, solutions in creating a mechanism that is transparent. Um, and it also might mean sometimes just a ring fence for donors, for uh, financiers to ring fence money. So this is for the most vulnerable that would otherwise be left out. So I think those are a couple of the main topics that came out of our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and may I now request Sakib? Sakib Hag to also share your thoughts from the group. Sakib? Hi, thank you, Susan. Uh, hopefully my internet will last up, but otherwise Barry can sort of back up for me. So uh, we mainly talked a little bit about sort of two structures of sort of uh, at addressing uh, getting a, a whole of society approach 
mainly from the information systems of how uh, local communities might be lacking in terms of uh, getting the right knowledge and the right information in terms of accessing funds or even the technical skills of what these sorts of funds are requiring and how they can engage with them, as well as looking at sort of the policy and other systemic structures that exist. And a lot of those ones are not conducive for local uh, communities to be able to engage in these sorts of processes. And mm -hmm. in terms of sort of the solutions we were looking at, perhaps having a little bit more thorough sort of uh, policy reforms, looking at taxes and land reforms, market systems that we could be sort of looking into, which aren't right now geared towards local uh, communities, but then how can we sort of um, reform them so that local communities are able to be providing value to these sorts of systems and processes. And again, in terms of sort of information gathering and sharing it, a lot of the times what one of the uh, discussions we had was how they're not really linked up or being able to uh, be put in touch with other um, institutions and entities, specifically government institutions, in terms of the information that they need to be getting involved with and how we could be coordinating those sorts of messages better and getting them down to the local level so that they're able to integrate themselves more into the processes and be a bit more effective in sort of getting access to funding. Um, if I've missed anything out glaringly, Barry, please feel free to jump in. Ah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Sakib. Um, Barry, did you want to? Hey, no, no, that was no. very okay. eloquent. Okay, I wouldn't allow you anyway. It's, uh, your time is used up. <laughs> Yeah, but I really like the fact that uh, you speak to some specific policy measures like tax reform. That is uh, really, really critical. Okay, so I do not see any hands up and we have two more groups to report back. Um, I, I won't call you out by name, but kindly unmute and think, uh, speak to us. I'm Robin here, I was facilitating one of the groups. I think Chris is gonna feed back kindly for our group with some of the notes you've taken. Sure, thanks. Thank you. Um, I think first of all, an observation I had was it was hard to be specific. I felt the conversation was very high level. Um, so I mean, things like the lack of political will to prioritize smallholders is real and um, there's priority given to big investments. So smallholders are neglected. Having a NAP, for example, a plan is not enough. Um, there was a sort of thing saying, look, we need to carry out climate change vulnerability assessments, but I think working out how was a challenge. That, that said, there was, we definitely identified a contrast and a change, like in Uganda, suggesting that the current uh, new climate bill has got much improved consultation compared to the past. Um, and Nepal, I mean, there's been a lot of work for developing plans at, at, at local level, a lot of that's facilitated by uh, INGOs through projects and the bad news is when the funding stops the consultation stops um, and then there is a little bit of a huge challenge about where's the commitment by government to funding the implementation. In terms of the main actions, we, this is where we got to, um, I mean it's recognised as a need to strengthen civil society and it's recognized it's good for governments to use uh, NGO, uh, CSO sort of coalitions to sort of harmonize participation. Um, but there was a discussion we need to attract more private sector financing through things like impact investment. I think we needed longer to really get into the substance. I agree. I agree. We need more time for this. But the good thing about this community is that we are saying that the conversation continue. Um, so the last the last presenter, please. Um, uh, hi. Um, yes. Yeah, I can feedback from our group. Uh, Fara was facilitating and anyone from our group, please feel free to jump in with um, any points to add. Uh, but for the first part, we were talking about enabling conditions like uh, broader acceptance, a change in culture, of course, so things like gender bias, um changing um and a drive we are seeing at the moment for delivering climate finance at local level and increasing that finance so things being built up for example with the momentum from the gca located action track um, another point was around ensuring that we support the mainstreaming of community-based adaptation conditions into national policies and local pol local plans and strategies um, uh, we spoke a bit about ensuring how financial support can get to the local people uh, how monitoring, evaluation, learning uh, supports this kind of momentum. Um, 
and just integrating communities and making sure they're getting resources. Uh, under the main constraining factors, we spoke about um, just having an awareness of these issues can help um, ensure they're being sort of resourced and addressed. Um, other things we're talking about are public-private partnerships, um, having, uh, we talked about the role of NGOs as facilitating and mediating between government bodies, funding partners, local partners. Um, we're talking about how many things are still being repackaged in different terms, but they're the same issues. I mean, to find a way to really tackle the power relations between things to address them, not just change how they are spoken about. Um, and again, also a mismatch between rhetoric and practice. So some projects are still being uh, done at community scale rather than actually working with communities. Um, so there's this kind of mismatch between needs and um, what's being delivered. Um, and then another point we talked about was financial institutions are still, uh, in terms of adaptation financing, it's quite challenging because it's so different from mitigation financing. Adaptation financing is very context specific and place specific, so it's a lot more complicated. Um, to deliver and so coming on to the third uh, question uh, that drew on from that it was around creating some sort of baseline and baseline assessments might be expensive but they will help uh, monitor change monitor how things are build a recognition build that sort of tailored um, approach for adaptation delivery um, and there was a couple of other things we talked about in terms of actions. One was around improving monitoring and evaluation of resources, so a tracking system, uh, youth and women inclusion at the local level, and really listening to the local communities um, about addressing risk and specifically like financial risk and changing mindsets and policy regulations around these kind of risks. Um, and finally, uh, needing a system to reflect the impact of climate fi adaptation finance at the local level which will help increase the motivation both at the local level for local communities to engage more as well as national level at the national level for governments to engage and take action and cooperate uh, with the international community to uh, sort of support the whole system excellent excellent thank you so much um all of you for reporting back uh, on such exciting conversations. I want to hand over to Barry to wrap this up. Thank you for staying the course. We are too late, but you have stayed on Barry. <laughs> yes, uh, so yes, big massive thank you for the contributions. Um, the conversation doesn't stop here. Please do take this over to uh, Hova, uh, I think I'm saying that right. The community um, boards. The community boards. The community board. Sam has instructed me to plug the community board. Please keep it active. Um, we we've also um, captured all the questions, so the ones which were answered, we will be passing on to the presenters and the contributors, and hopefully we'll be able to get back to you. But again, please go over to Hova. It's a good place to interact, uh, and you should be able to um, engage with the the contributors there. Myself and Susan are active on there as well, so please do feel free to engage with us. Um, we've managed, we've run astonishingly over time. However, we've retained practically all the participants, which I am going to take as a glowing endorsement of the session and uh, your dedication to this. So thank you very much. I'm going to close this now. Uh, but again, please get over to Hova, and if there's anything else, uh, let us know. But thank you very much for contributing. Cheers, guys. We're going to close the meeting now. <laughs>